home. It looks different for each of us. But no matter what yours may look like, there's a good chance that we all want home to be something similar. It's your home. What do you want it to be like? You need a heads up on this message. Uh, the title of the message is The Doctrine of Fun. And I need to give you a heads up. Uh, Thursday night's message was awful, in my opinion. And here's why. Because I'm not good at this. There are things I'm good at, and there are things I'm not as good at. I like to have fun, but I'm not very good at always having fun. If I have a tendency, it's to be more serious than to be fun. And part of the reason is, I think the older we get, the more convinced we are, we have to be more serious. But my Bible says that Jesus said, hey, unless you come to me like a little child, you're not going to get this whole thing, Preston. You're not going to understand it. So the burden for this message came out of a question the Lord asked me. And, and listen, Thursday night was excruciating. I have never been more miserable preaching a message. I can't remember the last time I was this miserable preaching a message. I literally preached the whole thing like this. Just, and you're probably going, he is weird. I, I am. I just wanted to confirm that for you. <laughs> I want to have more fun but I take very seriously what I've been called to do. And for some reason, for many years, I've thought you can't do both. <laughs> that if I, I'm gonna be serious, I can't have fun. Because over the years in the lobby, I, I have heard people say all kinds of things. Oh, hey Preston, I saw you playing golf earlier this week. Th this happened years ago in front of my boss in the lobby. Preston, I saw you playing golf this week. Man, I'd like to be a pastor and play golf in the middle of the week. Right in front of my boss. He didn't say that it was Friday, my day off. He just said, oh man, I'd like to be doing nothing and playing golf. And it's like when I have heard those things, I'm realizing it's as though I made an inner vow and said, you'll never say that about me again. I'm serious. And so I don't have fun. Okay, you know there's a word for that, right? Misery. I want to give you an equation because fun has an equation. And I believe it's this, moments plus joy minus stress. Moments plus joy minus stress equals fun. Ecclesiastes chapter six, let's start in verse one, read five verses, and this is heavy. I mean, this is the wisest man who ever lived. Listen to what he says. There is another serious tragedy I have seen under the sun and it weighs heavily on humanity. God gives some people great wealth and honor and everything they could ever want, but then he doesn't give them the chance to enjoy these things. They die and someone else, even a stranger, ends up enjoying their wealth. This is meaningless, a sickening tragedy. A man might have a hundred children Somebody actually said on Thursday night when I read this part of the verse, that's next week. <laughs> Out loud, it was awesome. A man might have a hundred children and live to be very old, but if he finds no satisfaction in life and doesn't even get a decent burial, it would have been better for him to be born dead. Do you see that in your Bible? If a man spends his whole life unhappy, it would have been better for him just to be born dead. His birth would have been meaningless and he would have ended in darkness. He would, have, he would have had no name and he would never have seen the sun or known its existence. Yet he would have had more peace than in growing up to be an unhappy man. This is so convicting to me. And it's not because I'm unhappy. I'm extremely happy. It's just... It seems as though I am in the habit of limiting my happiness. And here's my prayer in this message, that if you are weird like me, that you would allow God to free you from the bondage of unhappiness. And what's unhappiness? The opposite of being happy. 
So let me give you the ABCs of fun. Here's the first one, and it, these are all from the equation. Number one, address your stress. I gave you an equation and the ABCs. Why am I doing this? Not because it's cheesy, because I'm bad at this. And when we're ignorant in an area, we have to start with the fundamentals. In a kindergarten, what do you start with? The ABCs. This is where I got to start. A, address your stress. Did you know there's actually no word in scripture for our word stress? The closest word I could find is the word worry. But let me give you a definition in our culture for this word stress. A physical, chemical, or emotional factor that causes bodily or mental tension and may be a factor in disease causation. In other words, stress isn't just a mental or emotional thing. It can actually lead to physical problems. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25 says, worry weighs a person down. Okay, question. If life is like a race and the goal is to win the prize set before us, question, why would we make it harder on ourselves to win the race? Why would we intentionally slow ourselves down? Unhappiness, worry, stress is like a weight that weighs us down. Philippians chapter four, verse six says, don't worry about anything. Why? Because worry weighs us down. The number one reliever of stress is the sovereignty of God. The number one increaser of stress is when we try to be God. Well, what's the sovereignty of God? He is above all. He is in complete control. He's never been out of control. He will never know what it's like to not have control. God is sovereign. That, that helps me fall asleep at night. No matter what's going on in your life, when you understand Our God is sovereign. He has all power in heaven and on earth. He is in total control. You know what that frees me up to do? Give up control. Conversely, the number one increaser of stress is when I try and stay in control, trying to be like God, who is in control. Four things I want to give you which create stress. Four things. Here's the first one, overcarrying. Over caring. I'm going to make up some words here. Over caring. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Jesus says, That's why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Don't over care. Don't carry worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Okay, what are some of the everyday issues of life that we carry? or care too much about? Let me give you a couple. First one, what people think. What people think. How many of us, don't raise your hand, how many of us get a little stressed out based upon what we think others are thinking about us? It's an everyday issue of life. Don't care too much about it. Don't take this the wrong way. But I don't spend too much time thinking about what you think about me. Here's why, because I like to sleep at night. I don't want to think through, what does this person think? What does this person think? And so I have decided, here's how I'm gonna live my life. I'm going to think about how one sees me. And everybody else can get in line behind him but he's become so important in my life that I just really care about what he thinks, what he says, what he sees. A second thing, a second everyday life issue, what we have or don't have. Caring too much about what we have or don't have creates stress. And then thirdly, what tomorrow will bring. How many of us have ever cared a little bit too much about what tomorrow will bring? I have my hand up. I'm always thinking ahead. It's part of my job. 
Presently, I'm, I'm in a deep dive studying hyperinflation. I appreciate those who laughed at a deep level at that. You're what's called my people. Yeah, hyperinflation, it's real. I'm trying to study it. Because it's part of my job as a senior pastor, an elder in this church. I want to understand where we're heading and prepare. Now, I don't want to care too much, but I also don't want to care zero. Do you care too much about what tomorrow will bring? Jesus says, don't worry. Don't worry. Today has enough worry, enough issues. Don't worry about tomorrow. Second thing that causes stress, overcarrying. So first, overcarrying. Second, overcarrying. How do you know if you're overcarrying something? When your desire to care turns into a need to control. Now think about that for a second. How do you know you are carrying something more than God has asked you to? When your desire to care turns into a need to control. Lots of examples of this in the home. How about teenagers? Maybe you convince yourself that every choice your teen makes is because of you. So you put that weight, you carry it, and you forget. They make their own decisions. You do your best to train them up in the way they should go, but they make their own decision. As a parent, I can't overcarry that. I'm not their God, I'm just their dad. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Jesus says, I'll swap. I'll give you rest, and we'll carry the burden together. One of my, one of my favorite moments in scripture is when Jesus says to his disciples, let's go to the other side. They get caught in the storm. But before the storm, Jesus says, hey, you're not going over by yourself. I'm in your boat. Let's do this together. Okay, why would I ever carry something all by myself when I walk with the one who has all power in heaven and on earth? And yet, from time to time, we all convince ourselves. We get extra credit for carrying it all by ourselves. And here's what we have to remember. There's no extra credit for carrying it by yourself. But you know what there, there will be? A crushing. A crushing. Anytime I've tried to carry something by myself that God wants to carry with me, it crushes me. It causes stress. If you're weighed down from carrying something, you're either carrying the wrong thing or carrying the right thing the wrong way. Third thing that creates stress, doing what you shouldn't. Sin, doing what you shouldn't. First John chapter five, verse 17, all wrongdoing is sin. Here's one of the things I've learned about wrongdoing. Doing what is wrong, it affects me. It affects me, I carry it, I'm weighed down by it. A defiled conscience leads to a diseased life. It's one of the things we learn from King David. Listen to what he says in Psalm 32, verse three. When I refuse to confess my sin. Now remember, after Bathsheba, the whole Bathsheba episode, where he killed, had Uriah killed after sleeping with Bathsheba and getting her pregnant. Some major sins. He sits on it for a year. He, he tries to hide it for a year. Can you even imagine being the king that God loves so much and trying to hide something like that. And David says, until I confess my sin, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. One of the things we try and teach our kids, sin isn't worth it. Sin isn't worth it. It might feel good for a moment, but its consequences are not worth committing the sin. And here's the fourth thing 
not doing what I should. Most of us think about sin from this perspective, doing what I shouldn't. But there is another side of sin, not doing what I should. James 4, verse 17, remember it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. It's not just sin to do wrong. It's sin to know right and not do it. That's why I've always kind of laughed from time to time somebody will say, I no longer sin. Because of Jesus, I no longer sin. It's very sweet what they're trying to say, but it's so wrong theologically. And here's why. Even if they don't do wrong, I guarantee you there's still many moments throughout their day where they sin knowing what to do, which is right and not doing it. The Bible says both are sin. It's a sin to lie, but it can also be a sin to know the truth and not speak it out. These things create stress. Before you can cultivate a life that involves godly fun, you have to address your stress. Stress will get in the way of joy. And that's point number two, the B, be serious about joy. Be serious about joy. I know for some of you, you're like falling asleep because you're like, I, I'm the life of the party. Well, that's awesome. And someone like me has a lot to learn from someone like you. But some of us, we really struggle in this area. Be serious about joy. Did you know there is no extra credit for being miserable and following Jesus Christ? Think about this. Have you just, not this week, because everyone will cheat. But over like two months from now, just ask some people in the lobby, hey, how's everything going? And just do a little test and see what percentage of people respond with kind of a heavy negative tone. Oh man, we're, it's, we're good, but it's hard. I mean, it's just, we're taking shots. And, and I get, we go through seasons, but I'm talking about a lot of people aren't going through anything really difficult and still say, oh, it's just really tough. We're just taking fiery darts from the devil. And why do we do that? Because we think it's godly. We literally think it's godly to act overwhelmed and semi-depressed. This is crazy. And I wanna show you something that I hope, I hope changes me for the rest of my life. Because I've heard this, but I feel like I might've gotten a revelation of this for me personally this week. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. I'm not going to read the whole verse. I just want you to see something God is called. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. He is called our blessed God. God is called our blessed God. Anybody know what the Greek word for blessed literally means? Makarios, it literally means happy, happy, our happy God. This is crazy. You can't convince me that we all believe this because why would any of us approach a happy God like this? He's happy. He's not unhappy. He's a quintessential picture of eternal happiness. Our happy God. Then Jesus comes and the most important sermon in human history. And what is the point of the sermon? Happy are those. <laughs> I have issues. Because sometimes I act like he said, unhappy are those who choose to follow me. Now I know some of us are going through some tough stuff. But remember what James also says in chapter one, he says, count it all joy in the midst of trials. 
even in difficult times, one of the ways we rub it in our enemy's face is even in difficult times, we choose joy. We're serious about joy. We don't let him steal our joy. Philippians 4 verse 4 says, always, everybody say always. Always Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. This word rejoice means to be exhilarated with lively and pleasurable sensations. Chew on that apple, Adam. I say again, rejoice. I say again, be exhilarated with lively and pleasurable sensations because your happiness, your joy is full in the Lord. Not because I'm giving in a temptation, not because I'm seeking out pleasurable sensations. Joy is overtaking me because my joy is in Jesus. Jesus said in John 15, verse 11, I've told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Okay, what was Jesus talking about in John 15? The first 10 verses. In verse 11, he says, I've told you everything I just said so that you will be overflowing with joy. What did Jesus talk about for the first 10 verses? Abiding in him. So let's personalize it. Preston, if And when you abide in me, I want you to know something. Cupcake, you're going to overflow with joy. Preston, you're going to wake up giggling. Because God is a giggler. I don't know if you know this. That's what I'm talking about. He's a giggler. The older I get, the more I'm I'm, I'm coming to understand this. That one of my favorite things is to make God giggle. I'm going to preach about this this summer. There are things that make God giggle, I believe. I love hearing that sound. He's a happy God. And Jesus says, here's how happy we are when you abide with us. Your joy will be overflowing. So here's what this means. I'm going to give you a way to hold me accountable for as long as you call this church your home. If you ever see me in the lobby and I look overwhelmed, here's what I want you to come up to me and say. Wow, Preston, somebody hasn't been abiding in Christ lately, huh? It'll offend me just enough to be like, you're right. How can we abide and be unhappy when Jesus said, when you abide in me? Your joy will overflow. One more calibrating scripture for those of us who have lived our lives according to a a doctrine of occasional happiness and occasional fun. First Timothy chapter six, verse 17. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Pause. Did you know you were rich in this world? If you've never been to a third world country, go sometime. You'll immediately understand you're one of the wealthiest people in the world. We are rich in this world. Well, Preston, I don't have as much as so-and-so. That, that's not how you measure, measure wealth. We are rich for many reasons. Teach those who are rich in this world not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable, especially when hyperinflation kicks in. Their trust should be in God who richly or abundantly or overwhelmingly gives us all we need. Why? Somebody say it out loud. For our enjoyment, our happy God gives you what you need, not just so you have it, so that you can enjoy it. Everything God gives you, he wants you to enjoy. Question. What happens if God gives you things and you choose not to enjoy them? Here's a great one-liner for you. If God's goal is for you to enjoy what he gives, what makes you think he won't take back what you can't enjoy? Holla at your boy. (laughs) Well, God gave it to me. He'll never take it back. Okay, just think about this with my kids. If I gave each of my children 
a gift that Holly and I had been saving up for years to give them. And two of my children enjoyed it immensely. And one of my children became very miserable because of the gift. What a tragic thing. God gives us, he richly gives us everything we need for our enjoyment. Why are we so slow to enjoy the blessings of God? Well, I don't, I don't want God to think that I'm just here for the blessings. That's why I start every day singing nothing else. I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't owe me anything. Brilliant line. Genius line. And that's how lovers talk. But we can't take that so far that we stop enjoying the blessings God gives us. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 12 says, so I concluded, there is nothing better. That's a strong statement. There is nothing better than to be happy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can. If I were to grade myself on Ecclesiastes 3 verse 12, probably about a 54, 55%. Teachers call that an F. I need to have more fun. I need to be more serious about joy. I need to make sure when I walk out of my time with the Lord, I don't move into serious mode. I need to remain in joy mode coming out of my abiding in him time. And then I need to abide throughout my day so that when things get difficult, even in the midst of trials and suffering, I still count it all joy because I'm abiding in the one who is called the happy God. Here's the C, point number three. If you're going to have fun in your home, this is a biggie, cultivate moments which become memories. Cultivate moments which become memories. Flip over to Joshua chapter four if you put a marker there. We're gonna read seven verses together. And while you're turning there, let me, let me just tell you something about our king. Our king is divinely nostalgic. You know what's awesome about our divinely nostalgic king? He loves to remember things. You know what's even more awesome sometimes about our king? Is there are some things he chooses to remember no more. Know what I'm talking about? Isn't it amazing that our God says, I love to remember every one of the sweet moments of your life, Preston. I record every one of them as though I'm sitting in the front row watching you and you alone and nobody else, Preston. He says that about all of us. That the same God who says, I love to remember things, also looks in my direction when I've received what Jesus did for me and let the blood of Jesus be applied to every one of my sins, past, present, and future, that, that divinely nostalgic king looks in my direction and says, hey, but as much as I love to remember things, let me teach you a little theology, son. There are some other things I choose to never remember again. Joshua chapter four, Starting in verse one, we have one, I believe, of the most beautifully romantic passages in scripture. We're gonna read seven verses together, starting in Joshua four, verse one. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, take 12 men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, take 12 stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the 12 men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. 
Then you shall tell them that the waters, uh, oh, hold on, verse uh, six. Uh, where did I stop? I lost it. And Jesus said, then pass on before the ark, verse six, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask you in time to come. What do these stones mean? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. Not just in their lifetime or their children's lifetime, forever. This is what God says. Joshua, whether you realize it or not, this is a moment. Remember how I parted the Red Sea for Moses? I'm parting the Jordan River for you. This is how you're going to enter into the land of the promise. This is a moment. And I don't want it to ever be forgotten. So I want you to take a stone. Each representative of each of the 12 tribes, I want you to take a stone to the other side. And your children are going to ask you one day, what's so important about that stone? And you will tell them of the day where I supernaturally made the water stop so that you could cross the Jordan on dry land and supernaturally step into the land of the promise that I gave you. These stones shall serve as a memorial forever. One of my favorite things when we have family dinner is when question time turns into story time. When a question, like what's your favorite vacation we've ever taken? turns into a bunch of stories about a particular vacation. Remember that time, Daddy, when Tyler was trying to ski like a crazy person through the trees and broke his wrist? Yeah. Remember that time we went to Disney World and got five of those big bags of caramel corn at Epcot in two days? Yeah. Remember that time, remember that time, remember that time. I love that phrase. Here's why. Because I'm hearing the heart of my children say, Daddy, remember that moment we shared together that was better than so many other moments in my life. Here's the problem. In order to cultivate moments into memories that are cherished forever, we have to be present in the moment. Not focused on what's stressing us, not focused on what's ahead, present in the moment at the table with the ones we love, including him. My aunt, her name is Brenda. We call her Aunt B. I've called her Aunt B since I was a kid. She is the most fun human being I've ever met in my life. I know of no one who is more the life of the party than her. And when Riley turned 13, Holly and I took her to New York uh, to celebrate. And it just so happened, we didn't plan it, but my aunt and uncle were in New York at the exact same time. So we hooked up with them. We had dinner celebrating Riley. And that night, what, what's the tower that you go to the top in New York? The, it, it, he just said the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> Parlez-vous Francais? What's the tower? Empire. The Empire. Yeah, the Empire State Building. We go to the top of the Empire State Building and it's like midnight, like 1130 at night on her birthday. So we're celebrating, taking pictures. It's cold. We come down the elevator. And we come out of the Empire State Building and there's a limo sitting out front. And my aunt runs up to the driver's side window of the limo, knocks on it and says, roll, roll down, roll down. She says, I'll give you 150 bucks to drive us around the city and give us a private tour right now. And I'm sitting there going, this is crazy. He's probably about to pick up some VIP. 
What are you doing? The driver says, get in. (laughs) We jump in the back of the limo. The hatch opens up. He turns the music, music up. My aunt and Riley are having the time of their lives. You know what I walked away thinking about? Out of all the things that we did that trip, we took her to three different Broadway shows, bought her her first iPhone, which I still regret. (laughs) Let her shop. Out of all the things we did, you know what her favorite memory of her 13th, 13th birthday trip to New York City was? My aunt flagging down a limo and driving us around at midnight. Here's the commitment I wanna make for the rest of my life in my home. I'm here for the fun because I serve the happy God, not the God who wants me to be miserable. Please hear me, I'm not talking about prosperity gospel. He wants me to be happy and filled with joy even when I'm going through really difficult stuff. But you know what? It's easier for me to be happy in difficulty than it is when things are awesome. And so, maybe like me, you need to be indoctrinated in the area of fun by the God who is called the happy God. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Lord, can we just tell you how great it is that you're not the unhappy God? The miserable frowny face God. You're the happy God. And I'm one of your children. And you're the best thing about my life. Why? Why would I ever be anything but happy serving my happy daddy? Holding hands with my happy father. Lord, I pray if there's anybody here who's experiencing major levels of stress due to one thing or another, Jesus, I pray you would literally speak to their hearts in this moment and say, come to me. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens. I'll help you. I'm there for you. Jesus, would you give them rest? if stress has been their normal in this season. Lord, I pray for those for whom it's a little bit more difficult to be serious about joy all the time. Lord, I pray you'd give each of us an anointing to be joyful. Love, joy. It's a fruit produced by your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, would you produce more joy in each of us? And when we try and get too serious, for whatever reason, Holy Spirit, would you correct us and help us by cultivating joy in the soil of our everyday lives? And God, I pray over every person here, Lord, every person here has people in their life. They have people in their life whom they love. God, would you give them an anointing to cultivate moments that turn into cherished memories forever? Mm -hmm. 
Lord, I'm going to practice what I preach. I thank you that I got to have a moment today. That's a memory I'll cherish forever. I got to baptize my only daughter. And I got to shove it in the devil's face. She is buried with Christ in baptism and raised to live a new life in him. God, would you help us all be more present in the mundane moments of our everyday lives that have the power to be. When you are involved, they have the power to become cherished memories. God, would you fill our lives, not with idols, but with memorial stones, limo moments, crazy fun moments. Oh, happy God, help us be more happy no matter what. In Christ's name, amen.